good to see you, sir. Um, so, Simon, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask you all sorts of extremely difficult, awkward and embarrassing questions for about half an hour. Uh, and then we'll take some uh, questions from the floor. Uh, the first question is, what would you like to drink? White wine or white wine? <laughs> I love white wine, thank you very much. Well, I'll get you a white wine. Um, but let, let's start at the beginning, which sort of predates your um, 20 years of service. Just tell us a little about Forest why it was set up all those years ago in 1999. What's its mission been in the 20 years without you and in the 20 years since? Well, legend has it that uh, Forrest was actually set up by a former Battle of Britain fighter pilot called Sir Christopher Foxley Norris. And he was a lifelong That's pipe so smoker. That's made up. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was a lifelong pipe smoker. And as I say, legend has it, he was standing on Reading Railway Station one morning, puffing away on his pipe, minding his own business, and uh, some old biddy walked up to him and told him to put his pipe out. And he was so outraged by this, he thought, well, we're going to set up a group to represent smokers. Now, to put it in perspective, Ash had been set up a few years earlier, in 1972. So Forrest, um, if you like, was a sort of direct response to, to Ash, and that's why we were stuck with these terrible acronyms. Uh, if Forrest was set up today, we'd choose a completely different name, but we're stuck with it. What would you choose? Smokers United, something simple that actually says what it is. I mean, the problem with Forrest, Freedom Organisation of the Right to Enjoy Smoking Tobacco, is that, apart from being long-winded, um, the reality is it's harder to evolve, because as we'll talk about later, we'll go on to talk about e-cigarettes and all the rest of it. At the moment, obviously, because of the name, we're rather stuck just talking about tobacco, and we really want to evolve into other areas. And what on earth led you, a non-smoker, to... Uh, devote the last 20 years of your professional career to defending ne'er-do-wells like me um, in the public domain? Well, uh, it's nice of you to call it a professional career. I, I've never uh, really had a career. <laughs> um, I mean, my background is that I worked in public relations for uh, several years. I was a freelance journalist uh, working mostly for in-house magazines for about 15 uh, I was director of something called the Media Monitoring Unit in the 80s, uh, which monitored the BBC and ITV current affairs programmes for political bias. And uh, one of the sort of successes that we had at the time, when we produced our first report in 1986, I mean, it was like a telephone directory, because I'd sat you know, hour after hour, day after day, month after month, watching all these programmes and then pronouncing on whether they were biased one way or the other. Um, but anyway, we had a fantastic front page headline on the Evening Standard, which appeared on every, uh, everywhere where they were selling the paper all over London. And the headline was, yes, the BBC is biased. And my career has been downhill ever since, and I've ended up uh, you know, working for Forrest. But no, I actually knew about Forrest from the early days, because I was in public relations, and I was working with somebody that you know uh, very well, Kevin Bell. And uh, Kevin knew the, the very first uh, director of Forrest, uh, called Stephen Ayres. So I was always aware of Forrest, and uh, because I'd operated on the fringes of student politics, a lot of the people who ended up working for Forrest came from that background. And I was actually working in Edinburgh in the 90s, sharing an office with uh, Brian Monteith. Now, Brian is actually a former a member of the Scottish Parliament, standing for the Brexit Party, actually, in the European elections. Who isn't these well, days? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Brian and I were sharing a, uh, an office, and he was Forest uh, Scottish spokesman. So I basically sat, you know, at, at my desk, my computer, and I could hear Brian doing all these interviews on the radio. And uh, when the job came up in London, Brian said, why don't you go for it? And actually, I had already done um, a research project for the, what was the Tobacco Advisory Council, later became the Tobacco Manufacturers Association, in terms of media coverage of the tobacco industry. So I had that background, and the forest job came up. Um, I was keen to move back to London, and that's how it came about. Uh, but you having, prior to that, worked out how completely biased... Um, mainstream media coverage is. You must have known that you were letting yourself in for something absolutely horrific. Um, it hasn't improved, despite the efforts of your monitoring unit from many years ago. In fact, I was, uh, about a year ago, I was talking to, to a, a senior BBC journalist, uh, whose name I probably shouldn't mention. I might do later if, uh, in the drinks afterwards. He said, I hate all of this stuff about people claiming the BBC's 
biased. It's, uh, you know, so what do you mean specifically? He sort of says, so Mark, do you consider match of the day to be biased? He said, absolutely it's biased. It was about the most pro-Liverpool FC broadcast <laughs> you could possibly see. Their biases everywhere. But you must have known when you took on the job that this was, well, we'll, we'll come to a moment into whether it's a losing battle, but you were going to have to push water uphill to make this case, right? Yes, but in a way that was part of the attraction of the job and it's always been uh, that challenge that I've enjoyed. I mean, going back to university, uh, I ran a student newspaper. That was in opposition to the official student paper. We ran candidates at university elections um, for NUS conferences and they would stand on the platform that if they won, they wouldn't go to the NUS conference. <laughs> and we, so we, we were all, I, I've always quite enjoyed uh, being, if you like, part of the majority and taking on the so-called establishment. Now at university, the establishment in uh, student politics was the left. And again, taking on the BBC, I mean, that was actually great fun, just ruffling a few feathers. I mean, you're right, over the, uh, we didn't change anything. But the fact is, we got BBC and ITV executives coming to our press conferences, listening to what we had to say. And I love that challenge. And I have to say, the reason I'm slightly nervous tonight is because I'm aware that uh, you know, there won't many, be many of you who are you know, voraciously anti-tobacco. And actually, it's far more fun to have a really hostile audience. I mean, there's nothing better than walking into a room where you know that virtually nobody agrees with you. It's far more nerve-wracking going to a room where people are more on your side. I'm looking around this room. I, you may have led to a conclusion. We'll, we'll see when we get to Q&A on, on that one. Um, but I can remember back in the day um, certain freedoms as a smoker I took entirely for granted uh, that would now be considered inconceivable to get back. Um, and in fact, uh, just last week I was at a, a libertarian conference in Athens. I'd never been to uh, mainland Greece before. And um, you could smoke in a restaurant. I mean, this was... No, well, I mean, I, like, I mean, obviously, I didn't ask to see the statute, but well, do you want a smoking table or a non-smoking table? Um, and, uh, you know, my God, this was absolutely retro bliss, right? Um, uh, it's amazing, just looking at it as a consumer rather than as a kind of campaigner or an advocate, how much ground's being lost, really. Um, now... I'm not blaming that entirely on you over the last 20 <laughs> years, but have you seen it as if you like, uh, I mean, we talk about this in British politics more generally as managed decline, or is there any chance at some point of a more major fight back? I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about how the landscape on tobacco's changed since you took on the job? Well, first of all, just... <coughs> to answer the point about uh, whether it's our fault as all this has happened. It's quite funny that uh, going back to July the 1st, 2007, when the smoking ban was finally enforced, and we'd been fighting it for years, five, six years, but on that day, um, our phone, you know, never stopped ringing from people phoning up to complain that we hadn't done enough to fight the ban. And it, it was an interesting one because it made me realise that although it had been in the news for two or three years, and MPs had voted overwhelmingly for the ban back in February 2006. The reality is <coughs> most people don't read the news. They are completely unaware of actually what's going on around them. So when the ban was finally enforced, even though it had been in the news for, you know, it was going to happen for 18 months, people didn't know and they wanted to lash out against the people they thought were responsible or the people they thought should have done more. And it's always been a bit of a problem that we've had uh, trying to generate opposition because mostly uh, people, if it's not happening now, then people put it uh, out of the way. Now, going back to what you were asking, how the you know, picture's changed over the years, you're absolutely right. I mean, when I started this job in 1999, um, Ash, for example, led at the time by Clive Bates, um, Clive was saying very openly, oh, no, we're, we're, nobody's going to talk about banning smoking in in pubs and clubs. All we want are more non-smoking areas. Now, at the time, you know, everybody was happy with that. We would have supported that. Why wouldn't you? I mean, it's all about choice. I mean, Forrest often gets called pro-smoking. We've never been pro-smoking. We've always been a pro-choice organisation. And yes, there was, it was quite clear that there needed to be more choice for non-smokers. They were now in the majority. 
and there needs to be uh, smoke-free areas in pubs and clubs. Of course, most workplaces have already gone non-smoking uh, by the late 90s. And even the hospitality industry, particularly in England, not so much in uh, Scotland, Wales or Ireland, where the hospitality industry lagged a bit behind in terms of improving uh, air quality. But a lot of pubs, uh, particularly restaurants, uh, they had introduced, spent a lot of money in some cases, on really good um, air filtration systems. Now, it's quite interesting. My predecessor, she actually left Forest uh, to join an air filtration company. She'd become quite an expert in air filtration at her time at Forest. And uh, I remember going to uh, Heathrow and Gatwick, where she'd done a lot of work with the authorities down there. And uh, they'd introduced smoking areas that had fantastic air curtains that prevented any um, smoke escaping. And the local retailers, um, they loved it. They said it really works. And technology does work. And the sad thing about the smoking ban is that the government was never prepared to really go into the whole issue of technology because the smoking ban was not about protecting bar workers. It was about stopping people smoking. I mean, we could have easily uh, found ways to accommodate smokers using technology. But what's happened over the last 20 years since I've been at Forest is that we've just seen a raft of legislation. I mean, the big drop, the big fall in smoking rates in the UK happened between the mid-70s and the early 90s, when smoking rates dropped from about 48% down to about 32%. And during that period, there were very, very few uh, regulations against smoking. Uh, I mean, the reality is most people stopped smoking or didn't start smoking because of the well-known health risks. And that's been the number one reason why people gave up smoking or didn't start in that period. And gradually, the smoking rates continued to fall, but not fast enough for government and for anti-smoking campaigners. So what we've seen over the last 20 years, beginning with the ban on tobacco advertising and sponsorship, then we had the uh, ban on smoking in the workplace, then we've had the display ban, um, ban on vending machines, most recently plain packaging. This has all come about because the government and successive governments, Conservative and Labour, have decided that they're not prepared to let the market uh, make its own decisions. They're not prepared to wait for society to change gradually, as clearly it was doing. They wanted to force people, and that's really what um, has driven me on to stay with Forrest and keep fighting these bans, because what I really hate is this element of coercion, this element of bullying. And that's what we've seen over the last 15, 20 years. It's not been about educating people not to smoke or to tell people about the health risks and let people make up their own minds. We've seen bullying and coercion. And that's really what, uh, I say, has driven me on. And I'll just say one last thing. I mean, one of the things, when I originally started at Forest, I have to say I only planned to do it for three or four years. That was my intention. But very early on, um, I went to... What you got looked. It's addictive, right? Indeed. So, yeah, if, Absolutely. If, if only they label things properly. Yeah. Well, I'm the classic example of it. Indeed, uh, smoking is, is addictive, and I've, I've stayed uh, doing it. But one of the reasons I, uh, that... Something that really impressed me very early on, in my very first year, um, I was invited to attend a, a conference in Seville. Um, all paid for, it was all very, very nice. Um, and... It was described as a libertarian conference where all these smokers' rights groups from around Europe would come together. And I have to say, I wasn't really looking forward to it. I thought I was going to meet quite a few headbangers, to be honest. I mean, libertarians can be like that. And uh, I thought Welcome I was going to meet... Welcome to the IA, Simon. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to have you here. Indeed. <laughs> and I thought I was going to meet a lot of people who were just smoking for effect, which happens sometimes at, at forest uh, events as well. People come along who never smoke, but they get the old cigars out and they prance around. And I thought it was going to be a little bit like that. Um, and it wasn't. I actually met all these very, very decent people from right across Europe who just happened to smoke. And they found it... They were actually generally upset that they were being bullied to quit. And I thought, really, at that stage, as a non-smoker, I thought, these people really do need a voice. And in most countries, they don't have a voice. Most of those groups that I met back in 1999 no longer exist because they lost their funding or, or whatever. But I believe that that group of people needs a voice because there are many people out there uh, who enjoy smoking, they know the health risks, and it's a legal product. And for them to be forced and made to feel bad about it, uh, I think is actually disgraceful. 
Uh, you, you were mentioning the smoking ban. I want to come on to some of the other restrictions in a moment as well and saying how, at least on the face of it, you and uh, Clive Bates of Ash would have been on the sort of same page. It's all about choice. You know, some restaurants will be smoking, some non-smoking or different areas or whatever. Um, why don't you think the market brought that about? Or do you think it did bring it about to a satisfactory level for the population at large, just not a satisfactory level for the public health industry? Or do you think there genuinely was some sort of market failure on every pub being completely full of tobacco smoke and that being unpleasant to the 70% of the population who didn't smoke? Well, first of all, I think it's a complete myth that every pub in this country was full of smoke. I mean, one of the problems that will never get the ban reversed, and I think we have to be honest about that, it's never going to be reversed. I still think there's a battle to be fought for separate smoking rooms, and we'll never give up uh, talking about that. But the trouble is, the younger generations, people below the age of 30, who perhaps only see, only see pubs as they are now, they are fed this myth that if you walked into a pub before the smoking ban, you were coughing fit to bust, you were surrounded by smoke. Now, yes, that may have been true if you went back to the 50s or 60s. I mean, in my 20s, 30s, I went to pubs all the time and before I eventually grew out of it. But, you know, I'm, you know, I can, I can only remember one occasion when I walked into a pub, it was in the East End, and it was so smoky that I literally, my eyes were watering and I had to leave. I can only remember one occasion like that. Is, now, there might be some other pubs where people were smoking, but my goodness, the idea that these pubs were a thug of smoke is a total and utter myth. And it actually got better and better as we came into the 90s and then the early noughties, because the reality was a lot of pubs, and I say particularly in England, spent a lot of money improving their air filtration systems. And, you know, it really wasn't a huge problem. Now, when the ban was introduced, public opinion was actually against a comprehensive ban. Ash would produce, using their pet pollsters, YouGov, Ash would say, oh, look, a majority of people are in favour of a smoking ban. But those questionnaires only gave people two choices, smoking or non-smoking, which allowed no um, level of nuance. Because obviously, if you're given the choice of smoking or non-smoking, you're a non-smoker. If you're worried that people are going to be smoking everywhere throughout that pub, you're going to you know, vote for non-smoking. But if you do as we did when we did our polls, and indeed the Office for National Statistics uh, did, when they carried out their surveys, you gave people a choice, and you give people four choices. And the four choices were smoking banned throughout, smoking allowed throughout, or somewhere in the middle, a compromise, mostly non-smoking with smoking areas, or mostly smoking with non-smoking areas. And if you asked, gave people that choice, you, uh, what the Office of National Statistics found, as indeed we did, was that only 30% of people, consistently, year after year, only 30% of people wanted a blanket ban. The majority of people wanted some element of choice. But what happened was the government decided to override that. Now, when I say the government, we're talking about the Labour government in 2006, because if you remember back to the 2005 um, manifesto, the Labour government went into that election uh, promising not to ban smoking in pubs that didn't serve food. A pub could serve snacks, but if it served food, smoking would be banned. So that was under the Health Secretary John Reid. Now, John Reid, I have to say, was one of the best health secretaries that we've had in the last 20 years. He had a very interesting background. He represented a very poor constituency in Glasgow. He himself had been a very heavy smoker at one stage. I believe he'd been a 60-a-day smoker at one point. Lightweight. You know, <laughs> yeah, well, I've seen what you bring back from holiday, so then it's... Um, it also, I won't go into his drinking habits, but I think it's quite well known he was a heavy drinker as well. So the thing is, he was an interesting character. Now, John Reid tried very, very hard to come up with a compromise that fell short of a blanket ban. He actually, at one point, asked us in for a meeting with him to talk about passive smoking. And it was clear that he was very sceptical about the so-called evidence on passive smoking. So John Reid actually was on our side and tried to come up with a compromise. Sadly, after the 2005 election, he was replaced as health secretary by Patricia Hewitt. She then went full steam ahead for the blanket ban that we've seen today. But that blanket ban was not supported by the general public. And one thing I'll add on to that is that we still do a lot of polling. And even now, 12 years after the ban came in, when we poll people, whether it's in Scotland, Wales or England, 
we find that consistently between 50 and 60% of the population support separate smoking rooms. Now, you don't read about it in the, the papers very often because people don't really want to talk about it. Tobacco Control and the government, they just want to tell you that the smoking bans have been a huge popular success. Well, of course, it had a very high um, rate of uh, people obeying the law because people don't, generally speaking, want to break the law. But even today, 12 years after that ban came in, there was a majority in favour of separate smoking rooms. But the smoking ban encouraged um, politicians and the tobacco control lobby to use the legislative process to introduce more bans because they got away with it. And this is the problem, that there are not enough people fighting um, anti-tobacco legislation because the majority of people don't smoke. The majority of people don't really care. And the reason that this... The issue of smoking, I mean, I do understand that if you're a non-smoker, you're thinking to yourself, well, why should I care? It doesn't affect me. But we've always argued very, very strongly that if you genuinely call yourself a small L liberal, you have got to support um, the smoking issue, if you like, because very soon it'll affect a product or an activity that you enjoy. Now, what's happened over the last few years? We've had consistent attacks on alcohol, on, uh, we've got the sugar tax, we see a tax on, on, on meat. I mean, this has all happened because too many people sat back and did nothing when we had a chance to do something with the smoking ban. And I say we've had a raft of legislation since. It's because politicians have been encouraged to think that they can use the law to f drive down smoking rates. I, I want to ask you a bit about um, consumers and, and then to ask, actually ask you a bit about the industry because... Uh, although, obviously, here at the IEA, uh, we have um, Christopher Snowden, who does a lot on these issues, lifestyle issues in general, not uh, exclusively tobacco by any manner or means. Uh, but uh, insofar as the um, forests in the IEA share a mission, is to try and bring about social change. And to that end, you know, I try and study which um, movements for social change have succeeded, even whether I approve of them or disapprove of them, is neither here nor there. But what seems to be an oddity, and I know we've discussed this at length over the years, I don't know why it can't be cracked, is that smokers won't stand up for their own rights. So if you were to... Comp I'm, I'm not saying these are perfectly analogous, but if you look at how the uh, legislative environment has changed over homosexuality over the past 30 years, I mean, this is absolutely unbelievable, or over the past... 50 years, from illegal to um, not illegal to sort of need gay role models to... Uh, I mean, you know, there, there aren't enough gay footballers, apparently. Nobody argues there aren't enough smoking footballers are in the Premier League, right? Um, gay marriage now legal. If you'd said 15 years ago gay marriage will be legal in virtually every state in the USA, you would have been considered mad. Some people now think it might become compulsory in some of the states rather than merely permissive. But whatever, wherever one stands, and I tend to be fairly libertarian on these points on that issue, it's extraordinary how a social change has happened in that area. Now, I'm not, it's not analogous directly whether you smoke or what your sexuality is, but total transformation from being illegal, shunned, to um, uh, certainly legal if not celebrated. Why do you think certain social movements, lifestyles, notwithstanding, again, the differences there are between them, have managed to move the dial forward, whereas in the particular area of uh, smoking tobacco, it's all going against the consumer? I mean, there are some millions and millions... You know, there are more smokers than gay people in Britain by a long way. And smoking might not be a defining part of your identity in the way your sexuality is, but the kickback seems trivial. Uh, fuel would be another one. You know, if you start massively dialing up fuel prices, the lorry drivers will sort of, you know, organise blockades or whatever. But if you start dialing up tobacco tax, sort of a smoker just seems to sort of shrug their shoulders, put up with it and move on. How... Why has it been so difficult to, if you like, politicise um, uh, and incentivise and get angry and active the base of people who actually consume this product? Well, I think the tobacco control lobby were very clever when they moved their tanks onto the whole issue of secondhand smoke, passive smoking. Because I actually think that for many years we were winning the argument that if you choose to smoke as an adult, it's your choice. And it's nothing to do with government whether or not you decide to smoke. 
But as soon as they started targeting, and this started back in the mid-70s, um, but it came to the fore in the late 90s, they started uh, targeting the idea that it's not just about your health, it's about the health of the people around you. And we started hearing claims that uh, a thousand people in the UK were dying as a direct result of passive smoking every year. Suddenly, almost overnight, that figure shot up to 11,000 a year. Now, there was never a shred of evidence that that was actually happening. I mean, there had been a few court cases uh, where um, staff, employees and pubs had taken their employer to court and claimed that they had got ill as a result of uh, secondhand smoke working in a pub. And none of those court cases were ever won because they were always... Um, there was always insufficient evidence. Uh, there were a few out-of-court settlements because employers thought, well, I'd rather pay £5,000 rather than risk having to pay tens of thousands of pounds in legal costs if I go to court. But when these cases actually came to court, not a single one won. Um, back in 2003, there was a study published uh, which was based on the largest ever um, research into passive smoking, uh, it was based on data collected between 1959 and 1999, over 50 years. And it was based on the effect of smoking in the home and the effect of what your smoking might have on your spouse. And the results were published in 2003. And it said, look, as a result of all this data, um, the impact of passive smoking on people who are exposed regularly to secondhand smoke, day after day, year after year, appears to be very, very small. And I remember spending the whole day that day when those results came out doing media interviews. And I particularly remember an interview uh, on Five Live where the presenter said to me, uh, this is a good day for you, isn't it, Mr. Clark? You know, essentially, you've been proved right, um, all your arguments over these years. And I walked away 2003 that day thinking, this is fantastic. We basically are winning this argument. But... Unfortunately, as we see in politics, uh, in politics, they don't care about science. They don't care about the facts. And what has happened is, um, say, smokers have been browbeaten into being told that they're harming people around them, although there's very little evidence. Of course, there's a, a, an issue of being considerate to people around you. I would never advocate that people just light up wherever and whenever they want. I think you should be uh, considerate. So <laughs> and you should particularly be considerate with children, clearly. Um, but we, that's, that's, that's what happened in terms of smoking. But do you think, this is really, is that particularly unique? I mean, I'm trying to work out, you know, take fox hunting as another example. So people who, you know, it's never appealed to me at all, but people engaged in it have been, uh, you know, there's been a ban here, of course. They've, been, they've lost their, their regulatory and legislative fights. But they were, they've been variously caricatured either as toffs or, you know, horrific people ripping, you know, innocent animals to pieces. But their reaction was, you know, a million people on the streets to complain about it. Sort of, again, a smoker's reaction seems to be sort of, you know, uh, that's the way it is. It is. I mean, I, I think... Actually, you know, you're more of an expert on this than, than me because you're a smoker. But I've never felt that people define themselves by whether or not they, they smoke. And um, I think it is very difficult to... I mean, we've, we've never even tried to have a march down Whitehall because there'd be three men and a dog. And, uh, you know, Mark <laughs> or, and I... Or, or, or wheezing <laughs> as, as they walk down the street. But Mark and I talked about this over the years. I know that Mark in the past has been quite keen on the idea of... Um, creating a grassroots organisation to represent smokers. Now, uh, Forest, and we've always been very open about this, we've never been a grassroots organisation. Uh, we've been a lobby group, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, I have a background. One of the jobs I did for some years was working for a membership organisation. And there was a problem with working for a membership organisation, and it's the members. <laughs> um, the problem uh, is the and members... And indeed the organisation. <laughs> 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 Well, the problem is the members want to run it. Uh, that's the worst thing about it is. Um, they, they want to set up uh, committees. Uh, they want to have elections for those committees. And, of course, personal politics comes into play. People are arguing with one another all the time. It's a nightmare. Um, and I believe in basically running a benign dictatorship. 
And that's what Forest is. And to be honest, um, it's worked reasonably well because we can make quick decisions. We don't have to report back to a committee and get them to agree on this and that and all the rest of it. So um, also, I have to say, I mean, Forest did try back in the 90s, before my time, to have regional groups um, with regional spokesmen. Now, that fell apart quite quickly <coughs> because when you rely on volunteers, especially to do media interviews, you have no control over what they say. And they can be quite extreme. Now, I have to say that what we try and do, we try and find a middle line. I mean, I like to think that we put up a good argument against our opponents, but we don't overstep the mark. You know, we don't bang on about health Nazis and health fascists and all this sort of stuff. There's a time and a place for that sort of language, but generally speaking, not on national radio, because it just makes you sound foolish and extreme. And there have been some volunteer groups that have been set up over the years that normally last, not lasted very long. And the reason they haven't lasted very long is because they have been so extreme in the language that they've used. So it's quite important, I think, that we, we come across as moderate and we're trying to find a sort of compromise between groups that are, you know, apart from one another. But again, I, what I have to say is that the smoking debate, I think, is quite interesting because it's very polarised. But generally speaking, it's very polarised between lobby groups. So you've got ash on one side, you've got forest on the other, and then you obviously you've got lots of other anti-smoking groups. But the general public, I don't believe, are as anti-smoking as we are led to believe. Certainly the polling doesn't uh, suggest that. We've been polling for years and years and years. And um, just before the government announced its um, the current uh, tobacco control plan in 2017, back in 2016, we published the results of all the polling that we'd done over the previous uh, two or three years. And the report was called Enough's Enough. And that is the message that the public was sending out to the government through all the questions that we asked them, whether it's to do with extending smoking bans to outdoor areas, whether it's to do with um, increasing taxation on tobacco, a raft of other issues, smoking on television and, and film, the public was saying, no, we've gone as far as we should. We shouldn't go any further. And I say there have been other polls where people, uh, the majority of people say that they want separate smoking rooms. So it's quite clear to me that the public, in general, is not as anti-smoking as we're led to believe. Because the, 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 the reality is, and I speak as a non-smoker, most non-smokers are not exposed to tobacco smoke these days. When was the last time you were seriously exposed to somebody smoking? I mean, it just doesn't happen. Because it's banned in the workplace, it's banned in all pubs, clubs, everywhere. Yes, you might walk some, past somebody smoking in the street. Big deal. I mean, that's not going to harm you, folks. I mean, you might not like the smell for a millisecond. But for goodness sake, it's not going to harm you. And we shouldn't be banning things because we don't like the smell. But the problem is the way that the tobacco um, debate has been portrayed in the media as it's, it's this very polarised debate between forest on one side, ash on the other. And I don't think that's uh, helped in many ways. And, of course, the other thing is, let's be honest, what's actually happened in the last 10 and 15 years is that politicians like to be seen to be on the winning side. We saw that with the smoking ban. And a lot of politicians don't feel strongly about smoking issues, but they will vote which, whichever side they think is going to win. And revealingly, shortly after the um, MPs voted for uh, the smoking ban in February 2006, um, two people from Ash published an article in The Guardian, and it's become quite famous in our sort of uh, rather um, anal circles where we keep referring to this uh, article. <laughs> And in this article, Deborah Arnott and her sidekick uh, wrote, basically boasted about how the smoking ban was brought about. And there were two things that they said. Uh, they said, first of all, we created a swarm effect. Uh, we, we got all these groups together. A lot of them no more than one-man bans. But we created this idea that, was, that there was enormous support for, for the smoking ban. Um, and they secondly, they said, they boasted. They said it was a confidence trick. And they used confidence trick in its literal meaning. They said, actually, we weren't confident we were going to get this ban passed at all by MPs. But they said, we gave the impression to MPs that we were confident that it was going to happen. And I think it was a very revealing thing to, 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 to say. And actually, uh, we learned a lesson from it. I think the problem is, too often, on our side of the fence, we talk ourselves down. We're very negative. We say, oh, we can't fight this. It's going to happen. You know, what's the point of even fighting it? 
Um, and so you get certain bits of legislation, the ban on smoking cars with children, for example. Now, I am the last person to suggest that anybody should light up in a car in a small enclosed space with a child present. But the reality was that by the time that law came in, fewer than 10% of people were actually doing it. The vast majority of smokers had stopped smoking cars with children years ago because they realised it was inconsiderate to a child who had no say in the matter. There was no need for a law because people had already voluntarily changed their behaviour. But we are virtually the only people who are arguing against that law. Um, and I, I think it's a, big, it's a big problem these days, but people are not prepared to stand up and fight these things because on our side of the fence, we're very negative. I was really interested what you're saying um, about sort of politicians going with the flow and wanting to identify with the, the winning side. There is, of course, one massive counterexample to that in recent days that the entire political establishment seems to want to associate with the losing side on the Brexit referendum. Um, but I agree with you that they tend to sort of go with the flow and also crucially want to be seen to do something. Um, uh, so if, if a problem's identified, here's the way to solve it. You, know, you need to find one child who's had an asthma attack because of smoking in the car and suddenly... Uh, uh, politicians or, or, or a good number of them are on the bandwagon and the vast swathe I think of the population and probably even the politicians don't much care about this issue right it's not a salient issue for them um, I can remember when I used to work for the Liberal Party the, the bulk of Liberal MPs didn't care about the smoking ban one way or the other they just really didn't care there were a couple who were uh, David Laws and Jeremy Brown and Linda Opick by recollection who were adamantly against on uh, sound Liberal grounds and they were one in two in favour. Um, Steve Webb, I think, was strongly in favour. But the bulk, the other 50 or so, just didn't have an opinion either way. So those very small clusters seem to be, to be able to move the dial. Um, I wanted to ask you about the industry, because, um, and, um, God, it's great to be on this side of the, 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 the argument. Who funds you? <laughs> <laughs> I've been wanting to answer that question. <laughs> somebody for, but uh, you're... Um, you're largely, almost exclusively funded by the industry, right? Yeah. Uh, question one, um, do you think that compromises you in any way in the arguments that you put forward in debate, given that your case is that you're representing consumers, not the, um, not the uh, industry? And after that, I'd like to ask you a bit about how you think the industry has tackled these various issues over the year. What, what would you have done differently if you've been working directly for the industry rather than uh, a funded group? Well, first of all, unlike certain organisations, we've been very opaque about our... Uh, very open, not opaque, <laughs> quite the wrong word. Very open about our funding. Um, Forest has been supported by tobacco companies since we started, 1979. And, yes, it gets thrown against us. You know, I'll do interviews and people say, oh, but you're funded by the tobacco companies. And, of course, uh, Ash like to get it in uh, as soon as they can. But, overall... Far from um, doing us a disservice, I mean, the reality is we would struggle to survive without that support. I think it's perfectly reasonable to argue that the tobacco companies should support their own consumers. Um, but the interesting thing is that I do actually think it's helped us uh, more than hindered us over the years. And I'll give you one example. Uh, nine years ago, we set up a group in Ireland. And... Volunteers had come forward previously to try and set up um, smokers' rights groups in Ireland without success. We, we were set up in 2010, and instantly we got some traction with the media in Ireland. And I genuinely think that part of the reason we got immediate credibility with the media in Ireland was because of our, the support we had from the tobacco companies. Because I think the general sort of thought process was well, if these people are supported by the tobacco companies, we'd better take them seriously uh, because the tobacco companies are not going to just throw their, way, uh, their money on, frankly, some, you know, nutters. Um, and it actually helped us. And within a couple of years, our man in Ireland was uh, being invited to give evidence to uh, parliamentary committees. I don't think that would have happened if it had just been a bunch of volunteers coming together. And over the years, again, you know, we've regularly been invited to give evidence to parliamentary committees in Westminster, Holyrood, uh, in, uh, in Wales, um, as well as Ireland. So 
I think it actually, in a strange way, gives us a certain amount of credibility. In terms of representing consumers, well, as I say, I mean, Forrest has always made no bones about the fact that we are a lobby group. We represent, we, we call ourselves the voice and friend of the smoker, which in a way covers us because it covers um, the, the fact that a lot of our support has actually come from non-smokers over the years, people who are against excessive regulation in whatever sphere. And, uh, you know, a lot of non-smokers do recognise that if we don't support um, smokers, if we don't uh, oppose anti-tobacco uh, legislation, then the lawmakers will very quickly, and the campaigners will very quickly move on to other issues, food, drink, and so on. So I don't know whether that answers your question, but on the first part of the question, certainly, I think the funding from the tobacco industry has actually been... Um, a benefit in terms of our credibility. Really the, the, in terms of the who funds you question that's asked of the IEA, it's the one they immediately leap to, right? Nobody's asked, ever really said, you know, are you funded hugely by, I don't know, a major furniture store? I mean, it's always, are you funded by tobacco, not by any other outlet? And we get criticism for it. Although... Well, one of the things is I don't think I get asked that question really by presenters anymore is because we've always been so open about it. It's on our website. There's no need, after all these years, there's no need to ask that, that, that question. The only person who loves to bring it up is uh, Deborah Arno of Ash whenever we go head to head. Yeah, same and, nice. you know, and, and the thing is, I think it's quite funny because it actually takes up um, quite a lot of the interview. We're not discussing the actual issue concerned. But actually, we then fire back, well, who funds you? And yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Ash get public funding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's always where public health attack us. In fact, I don't, um, I don't know if there's anybody from the British Medical Journal present in the audience today, but. Uh, today's British Medical Journal, if there is uh, anybody, uh, thank you very much for the publicity today. Uh, it, it only came out today, so we haven't actually managed to emblazon these quotes yet on our IEA banners, but we hope to have done so by the middle of next week. To quote the BMJ, very respected journal, with several Tory leadership contenders sympathetic to its ideology, the Institute of Economic Affairs is closer to power than it has been for decades. You will see that emblazoned on the wall. When are you next coming? Another choice quote, which will be emblazoned on another wall. After orchestrating a series of attacks on public health initiatives, the IEA may now hold the key to number 10. <laughs> uh, uh, these are going to be big banners and posters. So uh, maybe our opaque approach has helped us with a little bit of publicity um, as well. Um, so I, can, I can ask Mike then, so when the IEA gets into power, will you reverse the smoking ban? Oh, God, absolutely. <laughs> That's the first act, yeah. It's much more important than what we do about Brexit. Get your priorities straight. <laughs> um, I would reverse it completely, absolutely. Uh, uh, the, the interesting thing is I think if you did reverse it now, you wouldn't have um, all out smoking in pubs. Actually, I think a good. I think you would get market segmentation. You would have some that would be smoky pubs and others that would, you know. So I think you would actually get a much more diverse range than we had prior to it. Just because you re repeal it doesn't mean that you go back to what it was like. Um, uh, but I mean, I'd allow I'd allow television advertising of tobacco products. Um, uh, so uh, take that, BMJ. If I have got the keys to number ten, you're going to you're in for a hell of a shock in the next couple of years on what will be repealed. But the whole issue of Brexit, I think, is quite interesting, and I think there is a slight parallel with Brexit and with what's happened to smokers over the years, because what we've seen since the uh, referendum in 2016 is that people who voted for Brexit have been uh, told they were stupid, that they didn't know what they were voting for. And I have to say the same attitude um, is uh, taken up by the likes of uh, tobacco control towards smokers. Smokers are basically told, you're stupid. Um, you know, why are you smoking? You must be mad to smoke. And I, I think there have been a lot of, uh, sort of similarities. Again, you know, we've seen with Brexit that people have not respected the vote. And the same thing has happened with smoking issues, plain packaging. Classic example, when the government held a consultation on plain packaging uh, a few years ago, uh, ourselves and various other groups working together, we generated uh, a huge response opposed to plain packaging. Uh, the government consultation 
I think the figures were something like five, 450,000, almost 500,000 people opposed plain packaging, whereas about 230,000 people were in favour of plain packaging. Now, you'd think if the government's going to bother holding a consultation to find out what the public thinks about an issue, they would respect the outcome of that. But did the government respect the outcome of that consultation? No, it didn't. It went ahead uh, a couple of years later and introduced plain packaging. And what does that remind you of? You know, does it remind you of a certain referendum where the vote came out a certain way and the government ha hasn't respected it? No, it does. But that, again, the interesting thing is and uh, the lack of the kickback, right? I mean, the, the fact that the political establishment have uh, uh, failed to uh, execute the decision that was made has led to political consequences. I mean, who knows what will happen in the Euro elections next Thursday, but it looks like there will be a punishment uh, for the parties that have not listened to the, the voters. And I wonder whether those of us who are on the Liberal side of the argument need to work out how to uh, issue a few more punishment beatings. But the consequences, you see, for after the smoking ban, just using that as, as the one example, but the consequences, if you broke the law, especially if you were a publican, were very severe. You could not only be fined up to £3,000, but you could ultimately lose your licence and therefore your livelihood. And, I mean, one of the most extraordinary uh, situations I found myself involved in shortly after the smoking ban um, was on the day of the ban, uh, a publican in Bolton, Nick Hogan, decided oh, yeah. to let yeah. people smoke in his pub. It was just a one-off, essentially two fingers up to the authorities. He wasn't going to allow this on a regular basis. It was just on the, the day of the ban, came in July the 1st, 2007, he, uh, excuse me, he turned a blind eye to people smoking in his pub. Well, he got prosecuted. Um, he didn't pay the fine. Therefore, the fine went up and up and up until eventually the fine was £9,000. And he couldn't pay at that stage. And he got jail for six months. Now, we were involved in an online campaign to raise the money to get him out of jail. That money was raised within 10 days, £9,000 from people just uh, paying into a PayPal account. And I found myself with two or three other people going up to Manchester with £9,000 in cash in a suitcase. And the reason we did that is we were told by the authorities, you can't just turn up and pay um, with a credit card or something. It was literally what I imagine it must have been like going to an old Victorian debtor's prison to get somebody out. <laughs> but can you imagine what it was like? We were walking through a rather rough area of Manchester with 9,000 quid in a suitcase to get this guy out of jail. Now, for somebody to be jailed in those circumstances was really quite shocking, was outrageous, but that's the sort of thing that we're up against. Um, I want uh, to finish off before I'll take a few questions from the floor then about the, the future. Um, as, as you know, I'm a, I'm a very keen consumer of nicotine in all, all its forms, as traditional cigarettes. Um, I use heat not burn technology. I buy nicotine chewing gum from uh, the pharmaceutical lobby. I have an asthma inhaler, not particularly because I'm asthmatic, it's just it helps me smoke better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I always say to a security guard when I have to empty my pockets and it goes through. Uh, but the, 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 and they sort of say, my God, you've got an asthma inhaler and a packet of cigarettes on you? Yeah, well, if I don't have the blue thing, I just can't smoke properly. Um, the, don't you think the product and the industry is now changing so much? You mentioned the name now, not just because it's oblique, but because it's particularly about smoking tobacco. I mean, I can and I will use this ICOS device now, which I can legally um, consume inside because it doesn't actually combust tobacco. Is it, might it be the case that we should be, some would argue, and I know actually some in the industry argue, that almost sort of let combustibles die, you know, they're sort of on the way out after the next five years, 10 years, 15 years. Really, it's all about nicotine and finding delivery mechanisms for nicotine. And unfortunately, you know, combustible tobacco is, uh, is a dangerous way of people consuming nicotine. So, I mean, although it wouldn't be such an elegant acronym, the Freedom Organisation for the Right to Enjoy Ingestion of Nicotine, <laughs> it's just not quite the right, same ring to it. But if consumers in the industry are going to move in that direction, might it be the case that... Um, when I invite you back here in 20 years' time for the 40th anniversary of your... Uh, that we're, 
so, talking about combustible cigarettes would be a bit like talking about, I don't know, snuff or something. I don't know what the regulations are around snuff. Or pipes are now extremely rare. I mean, very, very few people smoke pipes, whereas, I don't know, 50 or 100 years ago, they would have done. So are you sort of in the wrong place? You're defending a sort of legacy industry, some might say. And really, nicotine and safer means of delivering it is where the future lies. Well, it's possible, but um, I would remind people that even today, after what has happened over the last 20 years in terms of legislation, there are still between six and seven million people who smoke in the UK alone. There are actually a billion smokers around the world. But in the UK, there are between six and seven million. I believe that across the European Union, the figure is something like 93 million people. Now, my view from a forest perspective is that we embrace all risk reduction products would be mad not to. I mean, it is the technology that's coming on the market at the moment that gives people a choice of switching to a potentially less harmful product. One can only welcome that. That's fantastic. And I just, again, go back to the beginning. Forest has never been pro-smoking. We're pro-choice. Sure. So it's fantastic at the moment that the consumer has a choice. But the reality is a lot of adults still choose to smoke. They enjoy smoking. One of the things in all the 20 years I've been working for Forest that I'm most proud of, it's a report that we produced, uh, well, we funded it, uh, but it was produced by uh, a research group called the Centre for Substance Use Research uh, based in Glasgow. And they did a, a survey that was based on uh, re responses from about 600 smokers, many of whom had you know, connections with Forest. So we didn't say this was representative of all smokers, because I do accept there are a lot of smokers who want to quit or will cut down or whatever. Uh, but we said this was a survey of confirmed smokers, smokers who basically uh, don't want to give up. And it was, quite, it was a substantial uh, survey. Uh, it took people over 20, 25 minutes to complete. Um, did ask people, why did they smoke? And people were contacting us and saying, we're so glad that you've asked us this question because nobody ever asked us. We're, it's assumed that we're all hopelessly addicted um, and that we all want to quit if we could, but we, you know, but we can't. But we... And anyway, the results of this uh, study of these confirmed smokers um, was that 96% of them said we smoke because we enjoy it. We get pleasure from smoking. Now, it's almost taboo to talk about smoking and pleasure um, in the same sentence these days. So one of Forrest's jobs is to represent those smokers who actually enjoy smoking and get pleasure from it and don't wish to quit. Um, we asked them a lot of questions about why... But do they... you think these... I mean, that, that's noble, I'm not... So, uh, but, but do you think, I mean, if we're looking back over Forrest over the last 40 years and you over the last 20 years, you know, is this the equivalent of the freedom organisation with the right to snort snuff in Victorian England? I mean, some people still do but you'd be down to a congregation of, you know, half a dozen people. Are you anticipating that over the next 20 years, 40 years or whatever, this will almost be a moot point, that there won't be a billion smokers across the world, there won't be 6 million in Britain, there'll be 20,000, because everybody will be chewing gum or, uh, or heat not burn or... I mean, like, Chris Snowden's given up cigarettes. Now, he's supposed to be our lifestyle guru, he doesn't drink enough, he's... Back to become a vegetarian, I gather. It's, um, yeah, but people are, I mean, I'm, I'm being flippant, people are choosing healthier alternatives. But at some point, the, if this number continues to decline, well, not necessarily nicotine consumption, combustible tobacco consumption, yeah, terrific. I mean, I think we should stand up for the right of snuff users. But in terms of volume, it's going to be more interesting, isn't it, to stand up for the right of e-cigarette users? Indeed, and we're already doing it. Uh, I mean, we, because we support choice, uh, we are fully behind anybody, uh, any sort of nicotine consumer, any consumer of nicotine, we will support their right to consume nicotine. And quite recently, for example, we uh, produced a report which was all about smoking and vaping policies in hospitals. And we were very vocal about the fact that a majority of NHS hospital trusts in England still ban vaping, even on hospital grounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we said that's completely wrong. 
I mean, it's ludicrous. Why would I mean? It's, I think it's bad enough to ban smoking on hospital grounds when you're in the open air, but it's absolutely ludicrous to ban vaping on hospital grounds. We and so our recommendation was that all vaping bans um, should be lifted, and hospital management should also be allowed to choose for themselves whether or not they want to allow vaping on hospital wards. It's up to them according to their circumstances. So we are 100% behind anybody who chooses to switch to vaping. But, and this is the crucial difference, I think, between Forrest and certain vaping groups, is that we will never throw smokers under the bus. We will never turn our backs on people who choose to smoke. Because this is about choice for everybody. And it drives me mad, I have to say, to see how often certain vapors and vaping advocates are very happy to throw smokers under the bus. There was a new vaping campaign set up a couple of years ago. And one of the first things they said was, oh, we've got to allow vaping in the workplace because wouldn't it be terrible if vapors have to stand outside and stand next to a smoker? Think of all that passive smoking. Well, that's pathetic. I mean, there is no evidence that if you're outside, standing next to somebody having a smoke, that you're at risk at all. And I think that sort of um, outrageous sort of comments really need to be uh, shown up. Um, and in terms of going back to our relationship with the tobacco companies, I mean, one of the great things, I think, at the moment, and OK, I sound like I'm sucking up to the companies that fund us, but JTI, BAT, and Imperial have all, in various ways, said they support choice and that their vaping products are all about extending choice to the consumer. And, of course, they're going to promote them as something, because on all current evidence, um, e-cigarettes appear to be significantly uh, a significant risk reduction from, from smoking. Um, so, of course, any sensible company or person would say to consumers, look, these appear to be a much less harmful product. Uh, why don't you consider switching? That's great. What I really, really object to is one company, and let's, let's call that company <laughs> Philip Morris, because that's the name of the company. <laughs> they are running a series of anti-smoking campaigns, which I actually relate to. Do you remember the, um, the famous Ratner moment uh, in the early 90s when we had the chief executive of a, uh, of a jewellery uh, chain, high street jewellery chain, basically say our products are rubbish and anybody who buys our products is an idiot. <laughs> that effectively is what, when, when chief executives at Philip Morris say there is no reason why anyone should smoke anymore, what are they saying to all their existing customers who enjoy smoking? Now, I say, Forrest doesn't promote smoking. We don't encourage people to smoke. But it's quite clear that a substantial number of people, even in 2019... I'm, intrigued by, I'm really intrigued by what you object. I mean, obviously, the, the, the different companies are entitled to have their different strategies. And, uh, but is it that different to, I don't know, you used to be a blacksmith and now you're encouraging people to buy motor cars? I mean, they're, they're, they're simply segueing the, the... I mean, they think this... I, I, I was almost giving the Philip Morris line. They think this product is dead or dying and is dangerous. And they actively want their consumers to switch. I mean, they're, they're not withdrawing Marlboro cigarettes from the shelf, but they're encouraging their consumers to say, well, why don't you give up Marlboro cigarettes and move to Icos or some other product? I mean, that, I, I'm not sure I find that offensive, the producer of a particular... The broad product is nicotine, saying, you know, why don't you move from this type to that type? Um, we think that would be better for you. I mean, it's a marketing yeah, strategy. I, I don't have a problem at all with um, a company encouraging its, uh, its consumers to switch from one product to another. Um, but I think in, in terms of companies generally, I think Coca-Cola are a great example of a company that has stuck to its guns and has offered its consumers a wide range of products, including its traditional recipe, which is full of sugar, but they haven't taken it off the market. They haven't changed the recipe, unlike, say, Iron Brew or Lucasade. Chris Snowden knows a lot more about this than I do. But Coca-Cola gives its customers a wide choice, and they haven't said to their customers who continue to drink the sugar-filled drink, you're stupid for doing that, and there is no place in the world for uh, sugar drinks ever, uh, anymore. Everything should be sugar-free. Yeah. Because they have trust in their consumers to allow them to make their own decisions. And it's not just what... Uh, I mean, some of the campaigns that Philip Morris are actually funding at the moment, there's a campaign that's just gone live in the last few weeks called Change Incorporated, 
Um, and if you go on and see the sort of articles that that uh, website is publishing, they are so derogatory of smokers. I think it's quite extraordinary. And there is a better way, and the better way is what the other companies are doing. They're saying, look, we are producing uh, products that uh, have a significantly reduced risk and we are saying we are extending choice, but we are letting the consumer decide. Like you, Simon, I uh, agree with freedom of choice as we do here at the IEA. People should be uh, free to live their lives as they see fit and a live and let live attitude I think is more important in the present maelstrom of British <coughs> politics than it's uh, ever been actually in our sort of political and professional lifetimes and you are a sea of calm, sang um, sanguine approach uh, and a measured approach is I think just what we need not just on this issue but across the board. Thanks very much for being our guest yeah. this evening. Thank you.